In November, Josh Shapiro received more votes than any other Pennsylvania gubernatorial candidate. People from all different walks of life have given me the honor of a lifetime to serve you as Pennsylvania's next governor. Now he's looking to the future. We're going to assemble a talented, hardworking, capable administration, one that looks like Pennsylvania. Live from your local election headquarters, the inauguration of Pennsylvania's 48th governor. Hello and welcome. You're looking live at the state capitol in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on this Inauguration Day. We are just minutes away from Attorney General Josh Shapiro becoming the 48th governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Hello, I am Dennis Owens. Welcome to an exciting day here in Harrisburg as democracy is on display as there is a peaceful transfer of power from Tom Wolf to Josh Shapiro. We are standing just above the stage where the swearing in will happen and where Pennsylvania governors traditionally are sworn in. It is the ca uh, the fountain side of the state capitol. Uh, the pomp and circumstance is underway. Josh Shapiro and his family should be walking out at any minute. Uh, Moments ago, U.S. Senators Bob Casey and now John Fetterman, two Democrats, uh, had took their place on the riser. We are awaiting, as I said, uh, the Shapiro family and other dignitaries. I, uh, I am sure former governors will be here. I saw Tom Corbett here earlier. We believe Tom Ridge will be here, perhaps Ed Rendell as well. Uh, it is an exciting time, as I said here. Uh, but let's take a look quickly, if we can, at Josh Shapiro's background. What exactly led him to this position. Josh Shapiro was actually born in Kansas City, Missouri to a pediatrician and raised in Upper Dublin Township, Montgomery County. He attended the University of Rochester where he majored in political science. He was the first freshman to win election as student body president at that school in 1992 and people that know him say there's no surprise there. Shapiro then earned his law degree at night at Georgetown while working during the day as a political staffer for Democratic members of Congress. In 2004, Shapiro beat former Congressman John D. Fox for an open seat in the State House in Montgomery County. He is a former state representative. And Republican leader Brian Cutler told me last week that the fact that he is a former state representative can only help him in his relationship with the legislature, which for the last several governors has been quite contentious at times. He was re-elected to the State House in 2006, in 2008, and in 2010. Following the 2006 election, Democrats controlled the State House by one seat, but the party was unable to unite behind a candidate for Speaker of the House, a little drama not unlike the drama that is unfolding right now. Well, Shapiro, as a young lawmaker, helped broker a deal that resulted in the election of moderate Philadelphia Republican Dennis O'Brien as Speaker of the House. Dennis O'Brien in attendance here today. Shapiro then was named Deputy Speaker of the House. He also practiced corporate law at the firm Stradley, Ronan, Stevens & Young in Philadelphia from 2006 to 2017. In 2012, he won election to the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners, giving Democrats control for the first time in that county's history. He won re-election in 2015, and that year, Shapiro was also named the chair of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. While Shapiro never served as a prosecutor, he announced his candidacy for the state's top prosecutor in 2016. He won handily and received a record amount of votes. He was sworn in exactly six years ago today as attorney general. He also won re-election in 2020. During his tenure he expo as AG, he exposed a decades-long cover-up of child sexual abuse in the Catholic Church and returned more than $200 million to student loan borrowers, seniors, small business and consumers. He also directed a fight against big drug companies and trafficking rings, fueling the heroin and opioid epidemic, including more treatment for those suffering from addiction. So let's take a look at Josh Shapiro's historic win to become governor. He got he won by nearly 15% with more than 3 million votes. It's a record for votes received by a Pennsylvania gubernatorial candidate. The race was the seventh consecutive race that a gubernatorial candidate won by at least 200,000 votes. Today, swearing in, just the beginning of what will be a long day for Shapiro, his family, his friends, his fellow Democrats, and Harrisburg insiders. Later tonight, the Shapiro Davis inaugural celebration is at Rock Lidditz in Lancaster County. 
It's the first time an inaugural event is being held at that vast entertainment production complex, which has helped the biggest names in music, Lady Gaga, Bono, Taylor Swift, prepare for their concert tours. Uh, performers tonight will not be any of those that I mentioned, at least not that we know of, but they do include Wiz Khalifa, Smokey Robinson, and Mount Joy. By the way, the Shapiro campaign says none of those festivities will be paid for with tax dollars. They're all private donations, and they did say they would release the list of the donors at some point. So the program is underway, dignitaries walking out. As we can see, the MACE and members of the uh, Senate or the PA House, I should say. We certainly want to keep an eye out. There's Mark Rossi. Mark Rossi is the speaker. A little bit of drama here in Harrisburg uh, surrounding Mark Rossi. He was elected by Republicans, or at least Republicans, helped to put him over the top to become the speaker. Republicans say he promised to be an independent. He has not yet changed his registration. It is still unclear as to how this arrangement is going to work, and the House has basically been at a standstill. But as you can see, they're not standing still right now. They're filing in to watch the inauguration uh, of Josh Shapiro. Uh, we do want to mention that a little earlier, history was made on the other side of the building in the state Senate. Uh, Austin Davis became the first African-American lieutenant governor in Pennsylvania history. Let's listen in a little bit to Austin Davis's remarks. I, Austin A. Davis, I, Austin A. Davis, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will support, obey, and defend, that I will support, obey, and defend, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and that I will discharge the duties of my office, and that I will discharge the duties of my office, with fidelity, with fidelity. Congratulations. Thank you. So who will be, uh, we should, let, let's uh, introduce you a little bit to the uh, background of uh, Lieutenant Governor. Um, he was a former uh, state representative from Allegheny County, as we said. Uh, and again, first African-American, and he is the youngest Lieutenant Governor uh, in Pennsylvania history. At this point, uh, we do have some analysts here with us. I'd like to bring them in. If you watch This Week in Pennsylvania, and we sure hope you do, these folks are familiar. We have Brittany Crampsey with Britt Crampsey Communications, and we have Christopher Nicholas with the Eagle Consulting Group. So, guys, I'm going to start with you since you're the Democratic-leaning one. You've sure. had a smile on your face since November 8th and uh, the big day that Democrats had here. How exciting a day is this? This is really exciting, and it's certainly exciting for Democrats. We had a great year, you know, taking the House, the governor's office, and, you know, wins across the country. But Josh Josh Shapiro won by 15 points, as you said. He was elected by Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Green Party members. He was elected by 3 million Pennsylvanians. I mean, we have a, a decent fraction of them here today. This is a huge, excited crowd. Uh, it's a special day. And there's uh, lots of parties. You're going to have a couple of outfit changes, I'm sure. I, I am going to have a couple of outfit changes. My Rock Lidditz outfit is going to be a little bit less uh, wintry, um, if you're going to, <laughs> to add to that. Speaking of outfits, my good friend Christopher Nicholas has his elephant tie, so you're, you're, you're bucking the Democratic right. day. Yeah. This uh, will be my only outfit today, Dennis, just to <laughs> let you guys know. I'm a one outfit per day type of guy. Uh, this is a difficult day for Republicans, given what happened, but an important day for the Commonwealth. As you said in the open, peaceful transfer of power. It's the first time in many, many years it's gone from two terms of one party to another term of the same party. Uh, I think the governor-elect, for another few minutes, Shapiro, has a decent residue of goodwill among among Republicans, but he's going to you know, jump right into the frying pan here uh, once he gets uh, sworn in. Well, let me ask you about that, because campaigning Josh Shapiro, you obviously can say lots of things and promise lots of things to lots of people. But when the rubber meets the road and it's time to govern, uh, the last several governors have had actually uh, difficult transitions with the legislature. Uh, but you got to figure the fact that he is a former lawmaker might help with that. So uh, Shapiro's go to line in the campaign was we're going to all get around the table and talk. OK, well, now you have to actually talk and make some decisions. And he jumps into a situation where the House of Representatives is not a functioning body. The last time they met, they couldn't even take roll call. So it's hard to start things when one half of the assembly is kind of not even out of first gear yet. And about, I think it's three weeks from today, he has to roll into a joint session and give his budget speech. Since the state house has not yet organized, who does he give his budget to? Who's the chairperson of the House Appropriations Committee? We don't know that yet. Who's on the House Appropriations Committee? We don't know that either. Right? Well, Brittany Cramsey used to, you were a staffer for Senate Democratic leader. I uh, was, Jay yes. Costa. Who is here uh, today. Uh, indeed. 
Josh Shapiro's promising, quote unquote, a reset. What do you think that means in terms of a reset with the relationship with the legislature? Sure. Well, it's going to be a reset with the d relationship because we have a new governor, obviously. But we also have a very different legislature. Republicans have had control of both chambers for more than a decade. And now that's in the process of changing. The House is a little bit dysfunctional now. But we're looking at three special elections in February in Allegheny County. It will tip the balance of power cleanly in Democrats' favor. But then we have not only divided government, but a divided legislature. So negotiations on things like Chris mentioned, the budget, are going to look very very different, but also in Shapiro's favor, in addition to his 15-point uh, win, is uh, a multi-billion dollar surplus going into this budget. So we're not fighting over scraps like we have been in previous years. We're fighting over investments in the Commonwealth. And that's an easier problem to have when you've got extra money uh, laying more, around. More money, less problems in state well, government, I would say. Remember, that money is federal money paid for by us through a different channel to get here. It's okay. taxpayer money, yeah, that's so for there's sure. there's no magic fault Correct, but money. it's better than a, than a $2 billion deficit is, is the point when you're is. trying to put a budget together. Let's quickly, we do have some, uh, and Austin Davis, by the way, is a terrific speaker. Uh, we want to uh, listen into some of the comments he made after swearing in. Again, he becomes Pennsylvania's first African-American lieutenant governor. Here's Austin Davis. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to acknowledge the historic nature of my swearing in as Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor. Today, I became the 35th Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania and the first African American to ever hold this office. While I'm blessed with this awesome opportunity and responsibility, it was paid for by the blood, sweat, and tears of those who came before me. People like Speaker Kay Leroy Irvis, people like Chief Justice Robert Nix, and countless activists and concerned citizens whose names may not show up in print but we're just as important to our Commonwealth's trajectory. They paved the way for this moment. That was Austin Davis, the new Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania. At the moment, I guess we have a Lieutenant Governor, but we don't officially have a Governor, or do we? We have Tom Wolf well, until... Yes, we, th this is the 90 <laughs> minutes of the Wolf Davis administration. <laughs> Apparently, that, no, they're not doing much besides queuing up to sit down and hear. What's the expectation? Obviously, Lieutenant Governors, especially recently, can play important roles. Mike Stack was not a fit with Tom Wolf in the first term of Tom Wolf. That became John Fetterman. John Fetterman, now a U.S. Senator. It seemed that Wolf leaned on Fetterman perhaps a little bit more. Uh, what role do you anticipate Austin Davis playing, given the fact that Josh Shapiro ran with him as a running mate? No, not technically. We elected him right. independently, but he embraced him early on after, you know, uh, weeding through a pretty impressive uh, short list of potential candidates for lieutenant governor, he selected Austin Davis. Yeah, the Democratic bench in Pennsylvania is deep. It's it's geographically pretty broad. Backgrounds are very interesting. And I think Austin Davis was the right choice to run with. And the office of lieutenant governor is interesting because there's very little constitutional requirements for the office holder. You have to preside over the Senate, uh, but the Senate is only in about you know, 30, 50 days a year. And from there, you can make it what you want. And Fetterman did an incredible all-county tour looking at marijuana legalization. He gained a lot of popularity from that across the aisle. And it'll be interesting to see what Austin Davis's legislative priorities are. What do you see as the role of Austin Davis? Well, I, I hope he shows up to work more than John Fetterman did uh, before his health issues, because that was an issue for him. I think Austin Davis is, is uh, I think, fairly inexperienced guy is a two-term state rep. Before that, he worked for county and local government. So this is a big step up for him. It'll be interesting to see how he does that. He has a very able boss. Obviously, Shapiro is very smooth in this business. But uh, it, it's kind of a wait-and-see attitude for the lieutenant governor, because like Brittany said, you don't necessarily have a lot on your plate. I mean, the biggest thing for lieutenant governor is, God forbid, there's some sort of catastrophe in the state, and they are the head of Pima, the emergency management people, and you can do well there, but nobody wants to see that, obviously. Um, so it could take a little bit of time for him to find an opportunity to show himself because, look, you know, hitting the gavel in the state Senate doesn't really, you know, lend itself to a lot. S Supreme Court justices have, are in. Deborah Todd, Chief Justice, will uh, swear in Josh Shapiro. He is just 49. He'll be 50 in June. Youngest elected governor since Dick Thornburg back in 1979. Uh, uh, youthful excitement. But his, his resume belies his age, right? And his baby face, for that matter. Well, I'm not sure about that. He's got a pretty impressive resume. That's what I'm that saying. That's what the word belies mean. I mean, his <laughs> resume is better than what you would think of his age. Yes. Uh, and he's got a long career left. So, you know, maybe two terms here, two terms in the highest office in the country. So there's, so, in, in fact, that's, but it's, it's worth noting, people are talking about the fact Pennsylvania is the largest battleground state. He has gotten three million votes the last couple of times he's run here. He's clearly popular here. Important if, state. if you can bring Pennsylvania to the, to the equation, that's a pretty big deal. 
and people are talking about potentially vice president or president down the line. I'm having enough trouble with this day, Dennis. Yeah, let's, let's get him get, let's get, him get <laughs> sworn as the governor. Think, let's not think about down the line necessarily, okay? Uh, but let's talk about what, what you think his priorities are. We expect him in this speech, there was a little press call yesterday talking about the speech that we're going to emphasize today in his speech that he has been a fighter for the, quote unquote, the little guy, whether it's someone whose uh, wages were stolen or someone who was abused by a priest in Catholic Church, uh, people of uh, gun violence. Uh, what 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 do what do we anticipate? Big themes. What are we expecting to hear? <laughs> There's a lot to work on in those three topics you just yeah. went over. But he's also done a lot of work in the opioid addiction crisis, uh, holding pharmaceutical companies accountable for that. And again, it's it's fighting for the little people, fighting for all Pennsylvanians. He's not tied to special interests like we've seen in previous administrations. Um, I, I think that there's <laughs> there's a lot there to work on, and he's going to hit the ground running. Obviously, he got three million votes. But one thing that has um, at least among in Republican circles. Uh, He's the attorney general. He's the top prosecutor. Crime is a huge problem in Philadelphia. Gun violence is a huge problem in Philadelphia. He's going to point it out uh, here today. He's got victims of gun violence here. Yeah, perhaps the here attorney today. general sort of sort of but, stuck more to meat and potatoes. But than I shoot. think average voters probably say, why would you blame the state's attorney general? Isn't that more of a Philly police chief, a Philly mayor, a Philly district attorney problem? Well, look, it, it, it's no secret that the governor-elect and the DA in Philadelphia are not buds, right? They have a different view of how uh, crime should be fought. So uh, to me, I think the the next attorney general, we're going to have a big election for that in 24. I think there'd be a push for that person to go back to, as I said, those more meat and potato issues of stopping street crime and violence and shootings. Because uh, we wake up every day to these headlines in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, other cities too, not just us. Uh, so I, I think that'll be a big issue on the campaign trail. Well, I think we're getting into a legislature issue yeah. here as well. I mean, the attorney general only has as many tools as the legislature yeah. gives them. They're an enforcement officer. I want to pause you for just a minute. If you're at home wondering who exactly is Josh Shapiro, we've got a, a, a nice bio piece we want to run for you just to get you ready for the swearing in of the 48th governor. Here's Josh Shapiro. The next governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro. Josh Shapiro's energy seems limitless when there's a political stage. That my name may be on the ballot, but it's your rights and your future that's on the line right now, and we gotta fight for it together. Or an open microphone. At 49, Shapiro is Pennsylvania's youngest elected governor since 46-year-old Dick Thornburg. Shapiro has a baby face, but he's no babe in the political woods. Born to Run could be his theme song. Shapiro was the first freshman elected student body president at the University of Rochester. While a staffer at the Capitol in D.C., he graduated from Georgetown Law and was soon off for Harrisburg. He won a seat in the state house in 2004, and many say showed enormous courage in a press conference of one calling for the caucus boss to step down amid the bonus gate scandal. We need leaders who possess the public's trust. Bill DeWeese does not. He also helped broker a backroom deal to elevate Philly Republican Dennis O'Brien to speaker, making Shapiro deputy speaker. In 2011, he returned home, elected a Montgomery County commissioner as Democrats took control for the first time in county history. By 2016, Shapiro was off and running again, this time for attorney general. In defeating Republican Senator John Rafferty, he got more than 3 million votes, most in PA history. We will take on the big cases. As AG, Shapiro's report on sex abuse of children by priests and the cover-up by the Catholic Church made international news. He also facilitated a settlement between Highmark and UPMC in a long-running dispute between the healthcare behemoths. And he secured $1 billion for PA in an opioid settlement. He won re-election in 2020, but was on the run again in 2021. Let me begin by simply saying Thank you, Pennsylvania! Defeating Republican Doug Mastriano easily by 14 percentage points. He is now in full governor mode. How you doing? Pressing the flesh at the farm show, choosing a bipartisan cabinet, and confident he can get past Harrisburg's partisan gridlock that's long plagued previous chief executives. I'll be treating um, the leaders of both parties with respect, recognizing the important role they have in the process. They'll treat 
my administration with respect and we'll work together to tackle these big challenges. Even the top Republican in the House is ready for what Shapiro is calling a reset in the relationship. Well, I think that Governor Lex Shapiro has a distinct advantage over any of his predecessors having come from the legislature. So he certainly understands the process, he understands the amendments and, and really what it takes to get a bill across the finish line. Detractors, and he has them, criticize Shapiro's voracious political ambition say he's not above backroom deals or backstabbing, and in complete seriousness expect he'll soon be running for president. But even his critics admire his devotion to his Jewish faith and his family. He met wife Lori in the ninth grade at Hebrew Academy. They celebrated their 25th anniversary last year. They have a daughter and three sons. For the state, it's a new first family. For Shapiro, it's a new job, and he's anxious to get started. And I want to be able to walk in on day one uh, with a team that's ready to go, that's prepared to get to yes, whether it's on a bill or on an economic development project or on a community initiative, and, and, and get our government working again. So the excitement is building here at the state capitol. We are expecting Josh Shapiro and his family to come out any moment now. It is a good crowd on Commonwealth Avenue behind me. In fact, this is my sixth inauguration, and this is the largest crowd I can remember for one of these swearing-in ceremonies. It is actually probably the warmest I can remember. Uh, temperature's about 40 degrees. It was drizzly this morning. It is overcast, but nonetheless uh, pretty nice, and we are just kind of observing exactly what is happening happening here uh, we're anticipating any moment now josh shapiro to come out we can tell you there are former governors in attendance of course governor tom wolf and his wife francis are here uh, governor ridge is here he was uh, using a walker to get here he has some has had some health issues we did not see governor rendell come in he has also been battling some health issues as we've heard uh, and um, and also governor schweiker is here as well as is governor Corbett. And it appears we've got some folks coming out. These are the Shapiro children. You know what? We're going to take this program uh, in its entirety here. It looks like uh, some of his uh, uh, boys uh, have a nice collection of sneakers, uh, colorful sneakers. Perhaps they got them for the event here. Uh, as uh, the father of two teenage boys, I understand that situation completely. N nothing is more important than the sneakers, uh, and they're looking good. So the uh, Shapiro children uh, are in attendance and the, the two younger ones uh, with, with the sneakers. His daughter is in college at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he has a, a, a daughter and three sons, uh, as we noted to you. But again, very, very large crowd here. And uh, I guess the only one we're waiting on is uh, the, the man of the hour, the man who's about to become the 48th governor of Pennsylvania. So. We're going to pick up the program now in its entirety. Enjoy the inauguration. and remove your hats for the Pledge of Allegiance, recited by Staff Sergeant Alyssa Van de Bundy, and remain standing for the presentation of the colors by the Pennsylvania State Police Ceremonial Unit and the national anthem sung by Carol Riddick. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please welcome the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas Choir, performing Lift, Lift Every, Every Voice, Voice and Sing.
And now, performing the Pennsylvania State song, the Pittsburgh Youth Chorus. the Wissahickon Faith Community Association. Community leader Shams Huda of the North Penn Mosque, Rabbi Gregory S. Marks of Congregation Beth Orr, Monsignor Stephen McHenry of St. Anthony of Padua Parish, Reverend Charles W. Kwan of Bethlehem Baptist Church. You may be seated. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this day and for the opportunity, O oh God, to share in this significant service. We remember, O oh God, the words of the prophet Micah, who proclaimed, what is it that the Lord requires of us? But to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Almighty God, we know that we cannot pertain the will of God without acknowledging you. And we know, oh God, we cannot have mercy which leads to harsh judgment, which will endure long forever. Mercy without justice creates a world where there's no accountability, no moral goodness. May you, O oh God, Bless us with both mercy and justice that we may humbly seek the good and the true. We celebrate today our uniqueness, our commonality. We come from different faith perspectives, yet are united in our fervent desire to fulfill the will of God and to strengthen the heart and hands of our new governor, Josh Shapiro. We pray, oh God, you might bless him direct him, give him vision, give him tenacity. He might lead our state with humility, kindness, meekness, that all of us will experience the blessing that comes from our new governor. Ribono Shalom Olam, Master of the Universe, inspire Governor Shapiro to release those reservoirs of spirit and mind which make us truly partners with you. 
Grant him patience and hopefulness in his daily tasks. May he never give in to despair despite the enormity of his responsibilities. Give him love for truth above cleverness, for people above things, for God above all else. Remind him and us in the immortal words of Abraham Lincoln that religious devotion is not about having God on our side, which mistakenly prompts us to condemn the faith of others. It is rather about being on God's side, which requires devotion to civic duty, tolerance, humility, justice, mercy, and peace. Dear Jesus, may the enlightenment of the spirit of the living God be with our new governor as he seeks to build a better world to establish new ties of friendship across religious, racial, and ethnic boundaries, to create innovative opportunities of service, to rejoice in the growth of all our children, and to lovingly and faithfully support our fellow men and women who are in need of God's care and affection. Our Lord, Bless our country and those who defend her, so that each of us may one day sit under our own vine and our own fig tree, and that none shall be afraid. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, give our governor the good sense and understanding to buttress the moral fiber of American life, that he may gird himself with integrity to successfully meet the immense challenges before him. May he never grow bitter, tired, or complacent. Keep him, O God, from pride, which won't allow us to see the need for real change when it is needed, and to stay the course when that is required. Most of all, O oh God, shield, shield him from impatient judgments towards those who differ from us. May he set an example for us all by listening to the desire to learn and speaking in the hope of teaching and courageously leading. May our newest, newest governor, governor Joshua, Joshua Shapiro, Shapiro always, always remember, remember that, that you, O God, are exalted whenever and wherever we work together to fulfill the prophetic vision of justice, mercy, humility, with understanding, tolerance, and respect for all. Amen. To administer the oath of office, the Honorable Deborah Todd, the Chief Justice of Pennsylvania. Please place your left hand on the Bibles. And raise your right hand. I, Josh Shapiro. I, Josh Shapiro. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support, obey, and defend. That I will support, obey, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And that I will discharge my duties. And that I will discharge my duties. Of the office of Governor of Pennsylvania. Of the Office of Governor of Pennsylvania. With fidelity. With fidelity. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, the 48th Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro.
Thank you. I am humbled to stand before you today as Pennsylvania's 48th governor. Along the winding road that has led to this moment, I have been grounded in my family and in my faith. And so I begin by saying to my high school sweetheart and Pennsylvania's newest first lady, I love you, babe. I love you. Lori and I are blessed with four amazing children, Sophia, Jonah, Max, and Reuben. They have, sacrific they have sacrificed so much along the way so that we could serve. And I just want you to know how much I love you. And I want all of you to know just how hard I will work for your children as Lori and I have for ours. I love you guys so much. I so appreciate our history-making Chief Justice, Deborah Todd, for doing me the honor of administering the oath of office. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice. May wisdom and the pursuit of justice continue to guide you and your fellow justices of the Supreme Court, several of whom are with us today. I'm pleased to be joined by legislative leaders and legislators of both parties, along with another history maker, President Pro Tem Ward. I'm grateful to be joined by her and Speaker Rossi, Leader Pittman, Leader Costa, Leader McClinton, and Leader Cutler. I look forward to making progress together. I'm especially pleased to be joined today by Acting Attorney General Henry, Treasurer Garrity, and Auditor General DeFore. And I'm most grateful to have members of our congressional delegation here, led by Senator Fetterman and Senator Casey. We say a special prayer today for our senior senator for a full and speedy recovery. There is no doubt that you will be stronger than ever and continue to do good for the people of Pennsylvania for years to come. We love you, Senator. <laughs> to our history-making Lieutenant Governor, Austin Davis. <laughs> and his wife, Blair, I want to say thank you for joining Lori and I on this journey for your partnership, and for your commitment to service. We appreciate you. I am particularly touched that several of our former governors are with us today. It's a real honor to have Governor Ridge with us, to be joined. To be joined by Governor Schweiker. To be joined by Governor Corbett. And while they are here, I know Governor Rendell is watching from home. Your presence here today formally celebrates the peaceful transfer of power. It also reminds us that while I am now entrusted with this awesome responsibility, it is just for a moment in the long history of our Commonwealth. I'll now do my part to build on your work and to leave this place better off the way each of you did before me. Thank you for your service. And of course, I want to recognize my dear friends, Governor Tom Wolf and First Lady Frances Wolf. Lori and I are so grateful for your friendship over nearly two decades and your guidance through this transition. Governor Wolf has led our Commonwealth and our residents through some of the most challenging times in our history, 
And he's done so with integrity, with acumen, and with an unwavering commitment to service. Governor Wolf expanded health care to nearly one million Pennsylvanians. Invested, he invested record amounts in our public schools and he modernized state government. And thanks to his leadership, we now find ourselves in the strongest financial shape in the history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, allowing us to make the critical investments of tomorrow. Governor, you have exemplified what I spoke of a moment ago. You inherited the work of those who came before you. You served with honor. And you are leaving us in a better place than when we started. Thank you, Governor Wolf. Thank you. I set out to build a cabinet and a senior staff that looks like Pennsylvania and reflects the people and the communities that I just took an oath of office to serve and protect. Led by our chief of staff, Dana Fritz, sitting behind me here today. <laughs> sitting behind me here today is the most well-qualified and diverse set of public servants in our history. And I look forward to doing this work with them for all of you. Thank you all so very much. But most of all, I want to thank you, the good people of Pennsylvania. You see, you inspired me. You taught me important lessons. You invited me into your homes, into your union halls, into your places of worship, and into your community centers. We walked our main streets together, and I listened to you. I heard your stories, and those stories fuel my drive to serve. Your struggles give me purpose. Your smiles and your tears, they have filled my heart. Your problems have become my priorities, your causes, my concerns. And together, well, we, together we've taken on the powerful, and we have empowered the people. People like Alexis, who was ripped off by a predatory student lender and whose story inspired a fight to take on that powerful entity and bring real relief to thousands of Pennsylvanians. People like Tim, who did the backbreaking work on our roadways for decades just to have company executives steal his hard-earned benefits, but whose courage led to accountability and change like the families who I've met who've lost loved ones to the opioid crisis. They've shared their grief with me, but also their resolve to keep up the fight to protect others from the dangers of addiction made worse by corporate greed. And like the thousands of brave survivors I've met who come no matter where I am and in hushed tones tell me their stories of abuse so the institutions that covered it up can be held accountable. Your stories and your courage, it stayed with me, and it will motivate me every day as I serve as your governor. Because ultimately, in a functioning democracy, it is your voices who should be heard in the halls of government. The voices of people like Danielle, who bravely told us her own story about her decision to have an abortion to save her life, and who I'm honored to have on the stage with me here today. The voice of the grandma in Lawrence County, who I met over 15 months ago in the first week of our campaign. She came up to me, she grabbed me by the lapels, and she pulled me close to her, and in that stern voice that can only come from a grandma, she looked me in the eye and she said, do not let us go back to what it was like before Roe. And thanks to so many of you here today, we won't. We won't. The small business owners like Jared Betts, who owns a community barbershop in Lancaster and is here with us on stage today. 
Like so many others, he told me about his dream and he built it, and now he just needs a level playing field in order to thrive. I remember the voices of the grieving moms who lost their loved ones, their children, to gun violence. I want you to know something, moms. Your children matter, and so do you. Your voices are powerful. Thank you for being on this stage with us here today. I remember the students brave enough to speak openly with me about their mental health struggles. Hear me on this. They are the strong ones, and it's up to us to help them. The family farmer looking to leave his land to his daughter, but lacking the capital necessary to make the investments to carry on the family legacy long enough just to see her take over. And the voices of those who put on the uniform at home and abroad to keep us safe. They leave behind those in service to us all. Today we're joined by Stephanie Mack and Brittany Siska, the wives of Trooper Martin Mack and Brandon Siska, who were killed in the line of duty just a few months ago. Thank you for being with us today. We continue to honor and respect your husbands. May their memories be a blessing. I want you to know that you, the good people of Pennsylvania, will always be my North Star. I'm mindful of the fact that you've shared those stories with me because you believe that I can make a difference for you. And that is humbling. Humbling that you've entrusted me with such a great responsibility. Not just the honor to serve as your governor, but the responsibility to stand up for what is right, to bring people together and to get real things done for you. That is my covenant with you, the people. That's our deal. You have spoke up loud and clear, and you gave me direction with your voice and with your vote. A record number of votes, I might add. It was people from all different walks of life, from rural, urban, and suburban communities, united to tell me what you think. You showed the underlying goodness within our commonwealth, that you want a society that creates opportunity for all people. From God's country to Gettysburg, I heard you when you said you want good schools for our kids, safe communities, and an economy that gives people a shot and lifts them up. You also sent a clear message. Democrats, Republicans, and independents, when you came together to resoundingly reject extremism here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> together, together, hope defeated fear. Unity triumphed over division. We prove together that we value our freedoms and that we are willing to do the hard work necessary to protect our fundamental rights. And to those who didn't cast a vote for me, I heard you too. And I will do my best every day to be a governor for all Pennsylvanians. But right now, now is the time to join together behind the unifying strength of three simple truths that have sustained our nation over the past two and a half centuries, that above all else, beyond any momentary political differences, we value our freedom, we cherish our democracy, and we love this country. Our democracy is indeed now stronger because that historic coalition came together and fought for it, voted for it. But our democracy is not a given. As our own Pennsylvania history shows, our democracy is a constant work in progress. Pennsylvania's first constitution in 1776 was regarded as the most democratic of its time. But it still took 150 years for women 
to gain the right to vote. Pennsylvania was the first state in the nation to pass a law abolishing slavery just four years later in 1780. But it took until 1847 for total abolition. You see, we worked at it together because we value our freedom. And as a people, we are committed to progress. C consider this for a moment. Our commonwealth was founded on the promise of religious tolerance. Pennsylvania, a place where Penn invited all to come and live and worship in peace and security. And now, in this place of tolerance, I stand before you a proud American of Jewish faith who just took the oath of office to be the 48th governor of this great commonwealth on a Bible from the Tree of Life Synagogue. The scene just four years ago of the deadliest act of anti-Semitism in our nation's history. Pennsylvanians, Pennsylvanians can indeed find light in the midst of darkness and drown out the voices of hate and bigotry. Yes, we can. You see, in every chapter of this Pennsylvania story, we got better, we got stronger, we got more tolerant. Our story is one of progress and prosperity. And today, today we come together under the banner of this new administration to write our next chapter with a keen understanding of our history and the voices that will guide our future. It will require all of us to build on Penn's promise. My own faith teaches me that no one is required to complete the task, but neither are we free to refrain from it. In this capital and all throughout our Commonwealth, we have a unique responsibility to keep doing the hard and necessary work to strengthen the democracy that was born right here 246 years ago. Each of us can make a contribution. And in many different ways, we've shown that when it's all on the line, Pennsylvanians step up and do their part. We rally, like Gen Z. Anybody from Gen Z here? Like Gen Z who continue to make progress on climate change and gun violence and reproductive rights. Like the two women in Montgomery County who bravely walked into a county courthouse and asked for a marriage license before it was legal and sparked a movement. Like those who marched with Dr. King at Girard College during the Civil Rights Movement to demand righteous change. Like the Pennsylvania service member who carried with him one of the other Bibles I was sworn in on today when he fought to save the world from fascism and defeat the Nazis in World War II and earned himself a Purple Heart in the process. You see, they stepped up the Pennsylvania way. We are all stewards of our democracy. And I'm mindful that as we celebrate this peaceful transition of power, we are proving again that our democracy endures and the collective work to strengthen it continues. This work, well, this work is more important now than ever before. Because we have seen over the last several years, we've been reminded over the last several years of the fragility of our democracy. How we have to keep working at it. How we have to keep fighting to protect it. Here in Pennsylvania, we didn't allow the extremists who peddle lies to drown out the truth. We showed that our system works. Our elections are free and fair, safe and secure. And we assume this obligation to defend our democracy, not merely to honor the work of our ancestors, but rather to build on a foundation so we can make progress for our children. That is why we do this work. You see, only by setting the table of opportunity 
and inviting all to come and sit and partake, can we advance the cause of real freedom? The kind of real freedom that comes when we devote real resources in that young child's public school to make sure she has a shot. The kind of real freedom that comes when we invest in public safety to make sure she lives past her 18th birthday. The kind of real freedom that comes when we create new pathways to opportunity by investing in VOTEC and job training programs like the ones that prepared IATSE members to construct this very stage and trained apprentice cabinet makers from the Carpenters Union to craft this podium I now speak from. The kind of real freedom that comes when you live in a commonwealth that respects you for who you are, no matter what you look like, where you come from, who you love, or who you pray to or choose not to pray to. Real freedom, real freedom that makes government a productive force for good, that allows us to tackle big challenges again and dream of brighter, more prosperous tomorrows, where our air is clean, our water is pure, our communities healthier, and our economy stronger, where poverty, poverty doesn't get ignored and prosperity isn't limited to certain zip codes in Pennsylvania. Where political differences cause debate, but do not give rise to demagogues. The real freedom that leaves its citizens with the confidence of knowing that the doors of opportunity will swing open if they simply push them through where everyone gets a shot and no one is left behind. That is real freedom. And that is our challenge. That is our calling. And that is the next chapter in our Pennsylvania story that we start writing today all together. That is our challenge. And so, my fellow Pennsylvanians, I honor the work of those who came before me. I affirm my pact with the people to listen and to be your voice. And I accept the responsibility that you've bestowed upon me to be the next link in this chain of progress with humility. And so, with my feet firmly rooted in we the people of Pennsylvania, with my heart open to others and my eyes fixed ahead, I am prepared now to do my part to move our Commonwealth forward. Thank you for this honor. May God bless you, and may God watch over the women and men of the Pennsylvania National Guard. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Performing you. America the Beautiful, the Lincoln University. And we thank you for joining us on this, your lunch hour on Inauguration Day as history is made in Pennsylvania. Josh Shapiro is now the 48th governor of the state of Pennsylvania. Thanks so much, ladies and gentlemen. We're now going to join our regular program already in progress.